Andrew Vandenberg, who's a professor at the University of Utah and also is affiliated with Google X. And he'll be talking about planning under uncertainty, challenges, and lessons learned. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sachin. So uh, indeed, I have uh, two affiliations. I am uh, at the University of Utah, but I'm on a leave of absence uh, from there, and I'm working now on the self-driving car at Google X. But uh, today I'll be speaking about my work that I did at the University of Utah um, on uh, planning under uncertainty. So it's a little bit of the things that I, being removed from that research now a little bit, uh, see and as challenges and also some lessons learned uh, that, I would, that I think is, uh, are, are interesting to share with, uh, with all of you. Um, so what is motion planning under uncertainty? Of course, we've seen a few talks today already that introduced this topic, but I want to go over it again a little bit. And this is just for example, it doesn't need to be exactly like this. But in, in principle, you're given some initial uncertain state, and I, I denote that, or like I depict that with some uh, point and a circle around it. That point is where we think we are, and that circle around us is a measure of our uncertainty. It can also be an ellipse. Uh, the bigger the circle, the more uncertain we are about where we are. Then we have some, uh, some goal region here, that is this green uh, dot, uh, where we like to what that we like to reach. And, uh, and we have also obstacles, and those are the red the red squares there, and we, do, we don't want to hit obstacles because then uh, we don't have a safe path. And of course, you want to move there, and there, as you move, there's uncertainty in your motion. That means if you press the gas pedal of your car, you know that you will accelerate, but don't, you don't know exactly how much. And also with the steering wheel, you don't know exactly how much you will turn. There's always a little bit of uncertainty because of the environment and wind and, uh, and et cetera, on unmodeled effects. And uh, there's also sensing uncertainty, and that is uh, depicted using this, uh, this thing over here. And what does this mean? There is some sensor here in this, uh, in this domain. And here it is light. And you can actually see your position really well. So if you're in this part of the domain, so here, you know you, can, you get a very good feedback about where you are. And if you're on this gray area, it's dark. You don't know where you are. So you don't get any feedback about, uh, about your position. Right? So, and, no, 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 and then we want to still reach the goal. So what, how do we formalize that? We want to minimize some expected costs. So what is the deviation from the goal at the end of our trajectory? Uh, well, how much control effort have we spent? Uh, probability of collision along the way? Those sort of things will we want to optimize, minimize, maximize, uh, whatever the uh, minimize in this case, of course. Um, so yeah, what, do we, what would you do, right, uh, in this case? So the answer is something like this, right? So what you do is you move first towards the light and also away from the boundaries to minimize the uh, probability of collision with the boundary or with the obstacles. And as you reach the light, what you can see is that your uncertainty decreases, right? Because suddenly you know where you are. So you, know you have a very good idea about where you are. And now you w once you know where you are, you can actually go back. And because there's only little motion uncertainty, you still know where you are relatively well here. You can actually make it safely through the narrow passage and reach your goal with, uh, with, with a certain amount of, of certainty, right? So that's what you do. So you first move to the light and then back. And that's not because I programmed it in. The goal of our plan and uncertainty is that this automatically comes from our algorithm as an answer to this problem. Right, so how does that work, at least in the, in the kind of work that I did? You typically start with some random initial trajectory that goes from uh, the start to the goal, say. And now you do some kind of local optimization, an iterative local optimization towards your locally optimal trajectory. So you see the trajectory uh, yeah, go downhill uh, using some descent kind of approach. And that's, that's, that's how the work that I did together with Sachin uh, works, but also uh, Rob Platt's work is, 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 is also of this, uh, of this kind. Right, and it's not really a path like this, like a just a path that you get. It's actually a control policy that will be returned uh, so that you can actually uh, online when you execute this know what you need to do given your current belief. <coughs> but yeah, you, convert, you converge towards a local optimum using techniques from optical, optimal control typically or optimization to, 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 to compute these paths. So what do you then do? So we have uh, some initial uncertainty, some initial belief. And of course, if we don't know exactly where we are, we could actually be at any of those positions within that circle, right? So we, sa we randomly sample 25 out of that. And for each of the 25 simulations, Right when we run the simulation, we don't know where we are, but we keep track of where we actually are. We run our control policy, and what you really nicely see is that in all of those cases with different initial positions with the same control policy, you all move to the light and then safely move through the uh, narrow passage. So even if you arrive a little bit more south here, you will still go take a different path through the narrow passage because of your uh, control policy. So uh, that, that, that's, how it, uh, that's how it works based on your belief. Um, 
And here's another example. So here the, comp the, the initial belief is actually completely different. We still use the control policy uh, computed based on uh, the other initial position, and still even that works. So it's also pretty robust. There's one, one trace that actually collided here with the, with the obstacle, right? But the others make it safe to towards the goal. So this is really, yeah, an example of belief space planning, right? Where you, where you really need to be smart about uh, gaining information about where you are before you can then move, do something else better or with a, uh, with a higher likelihood of success. Um, so here's another example, also a light dark domain. In the light you know uh, very well where you are, and here you need to go, and this is a very large initial uncertainty. And so yeah, again you first want to move to the light and then back to your green position. And this is a random control, this is your path, the, the nominal path as we call it, that is what would happen. But your actual point was here in this particular case, we don't know that because we only have a belief about where we are, we are uncertain about where we are, but this is where we actually were, and this is then the trace uh, that you see uh, using that control policy, even though your belief might uh, evolve differently. So here's another example. Um, here we have, if in fact, a car-like robot. The previous examples were just robots that could move in any direction, a point robot. Here we have a point robot that has car-like dynamics. And we have a different observation model here. We have two beacons, these blue dots, and these blue be beacons do nothing but sending a signal at a particular strength. And we know what strength they have at the time they are uh, emitted. So based on the decay, as the distance grows further, we have more decay of the st signal strength. We know kind of, with noise of course, how far away we are from each of those beacons. And because there's two beacons, we can then triangulate what our position is. Right? That is the very partial information we get on our position. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and we have two of those beacons. And we have also motion uncertainty, of course. So every motion that we, every control input that we apply, uh, has a little bit of uncertainty about it, what then will happen. So here you see one of the resulting trajectories. We start here with a fair bit of uncertainty. It moves towards this beacon, and you see that the ellipses actually grow small in this direction and large in this direction, so you get most feedback about uh, the direction you are moving towards the, uh, the beacon. That makes sense, because you only get distance information and not really any information of how far you are laterally to the beacon. But then, if you cross the beacon like this, then you get information from all sides, and now you're confident enough to make it all the way through the narrow passage uh, to your goal. And you see that it's growing, again, the uncertainty a little bit, and that's because of your motion uncertainty. Um, and here are some random execution traces. Uh, again, you kind of see them all do the same, same thing based on the same uh, control policy, but with different real uh, underlying truths that, we, that the algorithm doesn't know about. Uh, but yeah, you can also play with these cost metrics, right? These are uh, expected costs, and if you penalize uncertainty 10 times more heavily, I don't want to be uncertain during my uh, action, I want to know where I am all at all times, then it actually chooses a different path where it visits both beacons before it makes it to the goal. And what you see is that, it, that these ellipses, if you compare it to the previous path, are just a little bit ever slightly so small, ever slightly smaller, but it's enough for the algorithm to choose a different path because it really tries to optimize that uncertainty now. So, yeah, these are all, uh, again, see, you see automatic emergent intelligent behavior from the algorithm without yeah, explicitly telling your algorithm, okay, move to the beacon first, then move to the other beacon. That just comes out of the algorithm uh, by itself. And that's the beauty of, of belief space planning, the beauty of planning with uncertainty, that you get these kind of very yeah, nice behaviors uh, out of your system. Um, here are 10 random um, executions, and this is uh, nice to see, right? You have 10 pretty... Uh, like uh, like 25 um, like widely spread initial conditions, but due to the control policy, they all converge to the same kind of traces ultimately. So the control policy really works on each of those uh, each of those samples, and they all safely arrive at the goal. <coughs> so if you initialize your trajectory in a different local uh, optimum or in a different homotopy class rather, then uh, you don't get a path through here because of this algorithm, even though that would have been better. Uh, because it only, uh, it only, yeah, these, these kind of algorithms that I described, uh, right, where you just do some iterative optimization, only uh, will find you a local optimum, and not a global optimum. So, uh, yeah, so it does the best it can in the, in the homotopy, homotopy class you give it, but it will never find a path through, uh, through this one. That would have been a little bit smarter, perhaps. So yeah, that's really a downside of these kind of techniques uh, that, that are based on these yeah, iterative optimization approaches. So, 
And that is interesting, right? So what I have been talking about, I just gave you a few examples to get a feel for what, uh, what kind of problems we're looking at and, uh, and what, what the idea is. But more specifically, we're looking at Gaussian beliefs. Of course, there's all kinds of beliefs. A belief in general is just a probability distribution. You can, uh, you can take any choice there. You can even do particles or, uh, or other parametric distributions. But Gaussians is relatively simple, and we know a lot of math about Gaussians that, that work out. So and the problem is hard enough as it is already, so let's focus on Gaussians, at least that's the approach that I've taken. Um, of course, there's all kinds of limitations associated with that, but that's what I've focused on, Gaussian beliefs. So we have a mean and a variance, that's our belief. And we also focus on continuous state control and observation spaces. Uh, Hannah talked earlier today, she also has work that, uh, that is concerned with, with discrete uh, <coughs> state spaces or control spaces or observation spaces. This is purely continuous uh, spaces, and in some ways that makes the problem easier, surprisingly enough, maybe. And then also we have the belief dynamics that follows from these things, uh, right? How does one belief, so a current mean and the current variance of your, of your belief, how does that propagate into a next mean and next belief as a result of your control and an observation? That just is the extended Kelman filter, right? We all, we all know the extended Kelman filter. That's just how your belief dynamics work. So how does one uh, belief transform into the next given a particular control input? Um, yeah, you use the EKF. And in that sense, if you think about that, we have some state space, right? We have a mean and we have a variance, just, just a bunch of numbers. And then we know, given a control input, what the next mean and variance will be. So we just have a deterministic system in that sense. Not always, but if you take the maximum likelihood assumption, it's deterministic. I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, so in that sense, it's not that different from traditional C space planning, right? In the configuration space or in the state space, where you also have some dynamic system. And we have a control input to it, and we know where it, where it ends up. So right from here, if you just take this system, then we just have a normal traditional motion planning, you would think. But in C-space planning, we have these beautiful algorithms, right? These graph-based approaches that, that give us a couple of advantages. For instance, if you take a PRM in, uh, in normal motion planning, then you have, yeah, you kind of use that multiple times because you just lay out the, the connectivity of your space and then when you want to do a answer a query between two points, A and B, how do I how do I go between A and B, then you can just ask the PRM and it will give you a path readily available. Very nice for some applications. Other uh, nice application of graph-based approaches that, that allows you to do globally optimal uh, plans, right, using asymptotic optimality, RT star, or, or Sid's uh, new work, what's it called, Sid, like uh, your new star? Pit star, that would also be a great, uh, great, uh, uh, great, 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 uh, approach in this, in this category. And we want to use those approaches in principle also in our belief space domain, right? That would be great, and we can use it multiple times. We don't have to recompute all these, all these uh, expensive computations, and we can also do globally optimal stuff. I showed you I can only do local, local optimal uh, stuff with the, uh, uh, with the approach as it is now. That would be great. But yeah, we use this, and that, that doesn't give that. So can we combine this? Can we do graph-based approaches for belief space planning based on our experience with C-space planning. That's basically the question, the challenge for belief space planning, I think. And there have been a lot of attempts. So All right. So, right, so in the belief space, the space of the, right, we have a state space that is your traditional motion plan, just x, the vector x, so let's say in a 2D space, x and y, this is a very simple state space. We have, we have a, an obstacle here, a circular obstacle, and let's say we have a point robot moving around. Just make keep it very simple uh, to illustrate the idea. And then in belief space, we would have not only the, the, the position, like the expected value of the position, but also the variance of it. And this is not a really, this is a schematic representation, so we have here an axis of our dimension that is the expected value of our x-coordinate and an expected value of our y-coordinate, and then we also have the variance in our beliefs, belief state. That is, of course, a matrix if you take Gaussians of uh, two by two, um, but I just, let's just, yeah, like abstractly think it's one number, and then we would have something looking like this. So. This obstacle, of course, becomes like this same obstacle in the plane of the, uh, of the x and y. And then uh, here the uncertainty is zero, and here the uncertainty increases as far as you go up. That's why I made the obstacle a little bit bigger at the top, because if you're more uncertain, you maybe want to stay further away from the, um, from, the, uh, um, from the obstacle to minimize probability of collision or something. Right? So this is how the space looks. State space, belief space in an abstract way. Well, can we construct a graph in here? Right, it would be nice, like PRM or so, sample a bunch of points and connect them with lines. Well, the answer, of course, is no. And why is that? Because if you have a particular point here that represents a belief, right, in this space, so a particular belief about where you are plus some uncertainty, and then you have another point, another particular 
belief of where you are plus some uncertainty. But there is no path, or maybe this is extremely hard to compute a path, that will arrive at that exact amount of uncertainty if you would traverse from here to there. Right? A straight line through this space is not a valid motion in any means. That's not how the uncertainty develops. The uncertainty develops using your EKF. So you cannot just sample points in this space and connect these two dots like you do in PRM because you cannot solve the two-point boundary value problem given your belief space dynamics. That's too difficult. But you can do it here, right? We all know how to construct a graph in this space. That is just PRM. So the question, so this is typically not done. I've, at least I haven't seen much work that samples directly in this space and connects paths. But what people then do is, okay, let's construct a graph in state space. And this is an example of a graph in state space. Yeah, and this is easy. This is just PRM. Just to sample a bunch of dots and connect them with straight lines. These straight lines in, in my example are valid motions for this particular robot. Of course, you don't want to hit the obstacle, so there's no samples here. Yeah, so this is easy. But then we have a graph in state space. We still want to use this in belief space. Right? We want to see this light dark behavior in our answer. So the challenge then is to search through this graph. We have constructed this graph in our, in our state space, and now we want to search for a nice path through that graph uh, with our belief uh, uh, objective, right? Minimize expected um, probability of collision, or minimize expected cost, or minimize your uncertainty along the way, or something like that. So what you have in this problem is you are given an initial node. Let's say we are here. We think we are here, and we have a certain amount of uncertainty about where that we are actually there. And that is, again, depicted by this ellipse here. And the goal is to find a path to a goal in this, a goal node in this graph, let's say this one over here, arriving there, say, with minimum amount of uncertainty. So with the smallest possible ellipse, we want to arrive there. There's other metrics, uh, minimal probability of collision, like minimum expected cost doesn't matter for my argument here. So we want to arrive there at the goal with the minimum amount of uncertainty. Right? So. You go search in this graph. So there's in this particular graph, there's two paths, because I took a simpler graph just to make the example simpler. There's two paths to that goal. You can go from here to here, and then to here and there, or you can go this route and also arrive at your goal. So what happens to your uncertainty along the way? So let's discuss that a little bit. So if you move from here to here, along the way, due to the interaction of motion uncertainty and sensing uncertainty, your, your uncertainty about your x dimension has reduced a little bit and about your y has increased a little bit. Maybe there is a good sensor that tells you pretty accurately where your, what your x position is, but your y sensor there is, is, is crappy in this part of your state space. So that's the resulting distribution that you get. And then you move here, you see that the, the uncertainty about your y coordinate has stayed the same, right? But your uncertainty about x has decreased, because here there's a good x sensor. And from there on out, you actually go to the goal, and then your uncertainty about y increases again a little bit because there's a not so good y sensor there. Or you have motion uncertainty in the y direction, something like that. Okay, that's one option to take, nice. But we can also take the other route, and then you start of course with the same uncertainty about your initial position, and you go here, nothing happens, so you're kind of neutral in, in, in what happens to your uncertainty, and then you go up here, oh, and here you have really poor x uncertainty, so your motion, uh, your motion noise here, your motion uncertainty here is really wide, in the uh, really large in the x direction. So you arrive here with a belief, yeah, you really don't know where x is, and you have a pretty accurate idea of where your y coordinate is. And then on this last part, right, just like it happened here, we increase the y uncertainty a little bit, but apparently, we didn't see that in this behavior, but in this last path, there is very, very good x sensor. It tells you very, we were already very certain about x here, so here it didn't matter, but in this last bit, there's a lot of information about your x coordinate. OK, so then you arrive at your goal with this, this ellipse. So the question is then, what path is better? Which one do you want to take? Right? Remember, the, the objective is um, I want to arrive at the goal with the smallest ellipse, like the, 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 the maximum amount of certainty about where I am, or the minimum amount of uncertainty. So what, which, which one is that? Yeah, this one, eh, the, the right one. Because here, this ellipse is uh, smaller. Like, they have the same width, and this one is less high. So this one would be the one to take. Nice, you think, we'll do that. But however, there's a problem here. What if, what if this were the goal? What would then be the best path? Would you then go here? Or would you then go here? Yeah, then you would take this one, right? 
Yeah, and this is really the problem or the, the, the challenge of belief space planning because it means, right, that the optimal substructure property doesn't hold. Right, so the optimal path from here to here leads you like this, but the optimal path from here to here leads you like this. And that's a very important uh, yeah, thing to realize when you do belief space planning. That, that you can, that, and because every motion planning problem is almost always optimal, has al almost always the optimal substructure property, so we almost take it for granted. But you cannot do that here, because the consequence is that you cannot use Dijkstra's algorithm. That will not give you the optimal path, because the optimal substructure property is an, a requirement for Dijkstra to work, or any dynamic programming for that matter. Right, so that is a very important lesson. That in belief space planning on graphs that are that lay that lay in the state space, you cannot just use Dijkstra and think you're right. Right. In addition to this, to the fact that these paths are not um, do not have the optimal substructure property, there is also the cost of a path is also history dependent. That is a little bit a different notion, but that means that the cost to move from here to here depends on what happened before. If you arrive here with a big uncertainty you may have pay a higher price to move there than if you arrive with a small uncertainty, right? So you cost whatever your metric is, right? Uh, uncertainty or uh, probability of collision, et cetera. That is history dependent. So you're, if you don't know your history, you don't know what cost you're going to pay when you move over that edge. That's no also a property that you see in these, um, in these belief space planning problems. That is a different property than, uh, than the optimal substructure property. <coughs> Yeah, so what do we do, right? We still want to do this, do this right. We still want to somehow use this nice graph representation with all the advantages that I, that I just described. How much time do we have? Seven. Okay, good, perfect. So yeah. Yeah, this is also interesting to mention. Like, this is a really important thing to realize, and there's actually many works on belief space planning that completely ignore this issue. And I actually was doubting a little bit to go into a name and shame list of all kinds of papers that do this. I could. But like, yeah, I don't know, that's not really the community here to do that. I, I picked one example, because uh, these guys are really good, and this paper is awesome also for many other reasons. But they also make the mistake without realizing this, uh, at least they don't mention it uh, in their paper, that this optimal star structure doesn't hold. And it's still, there may, may still be very good reasons to just ignore it and go do your Dijkstra, but <laughs> you cannot claim any optimality or something or within your roadmap, so you have to be a little bit careful there. But yeah, it happens a lot in the, in the literature that this, is, uh, this issue is ignored. So yeah, what can we do? How can we make it better? Well, what you ideally want to do, then you're certain that you're really uh, doing the right thing, is go to all, through all possible paths in your, in your roadmap. In this case, there's only two, so that's easy. In, uh, in a general roadmap with a lot of cycles, there's an exponentially many of those paths. So yeah, it's uh, not practical to do that. Yes? But even, I mean, you could have cycles in, in this graph, which yeah, 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 sure, sure. You can also go around twice and then go ex uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. Yeah. But just for the example, in this, right? But in general, that is go through all possible paths exhaustively is, uh, is, is I impractical. I think we agree on that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we can relax, and I mean relax in the sense of Dijkstra, so you arrive with two paths at the same node. In some cases, you can relax. In this case, for instance, this ellipse is strictly smaller than this ellipse. So this, uh, this is a little bit different model that gives us different, uh, different ellipses. So now we arrive here at a particular node thr th through multiple paths, and you see that this ellipse really fits within this one. So the, uh, in other words, like the, the, the difference of this covariance matrix and this covariance matrix is still positive definite. So that in that case, you can say, OK, all possible paths uh, that, that go out from this node will have this path before it. Because the ellipse is strictly smaller in all possible dimensions and all eigenvalues, then you're good. Then, then, then you can relax and say, okay, we don't have to worry about where we came from. But still, that prunes a little bit of all these paths that we would have to go through, but not many in general, or not enough, perhaps. So yeah, um, this may not be enough, but at least that's some, something to start with, right? What can we do else? And this is surprising. Like I learned this in ICRA, at ICRA 14 by just talking to a, to a guy who has a paper on, on this topic too. If you reduce the richness of your uncertainty representation, we can actually, we don't have this problem magically disappears. And I found that very surprising. So let's say instead of a Gaussian, right, a Gaussian distribution that's a mean and, uh, and a whole covariance matrix, we maintain only, instead of the variance matrix, we maintain only the upper bound of the largest eigenvalue 
of your covariance matrix. Now, that sounds complicated. It's, it is not. It is basically we model our uncertainty with just uh, uh, like a sphere or a circle, meaning that it's the uncertainty is uniform in all dimensions and is also overestimated because it's an upper bound. So here, let's say this were a Gaussian variance, this could be an upper bound of your largest eigenvalue, just a bigger circle that completely encompasses your uncertainty ellipse. Right, that is informally stated what it, what it really is. Just one value, right, one, one number. And in that case, and then you want to do the same kind of uh, framework, so you have belief dynamics for Gaussians, that we saw that that is the EKF, and now you, but there's also belief dynamics for these upper bound of largest eigenvalue, like formula similar to the EKF, to propagate that through your system. So you have currently an upper bound, and then you apply a control, and you get an observation, and you get a new upper bound. And these formulas appear in this paper. And this is the guy I was talking to at ICRA 14. And we made it, I mean, this paper is not about um, optimal substructure properties at all, but it was very nice to just realize that talking uh, to him uh, at ICRA. Because what happens then, is that you can currently only have circles as your um, uncertainty. And one circle will always be smaller than the other, strictly so, right? Also in the, in the positive definite sense of your matrix. So if you then go through here, and of course you have a less rich representation, so you only have circles. But this circle here is smaller than this one. So you will always want to go here, right? Whatever happens after. So suddenly, by making this representation Less rich, so go going from a full covariance matrix to just one number, suddenly, maybe it's just a fluke of, of, a, of a, like an incidence, coincidence here, but uh, suddenly we don't have to worry about this uh, optimal substructure property. Of course, you still have history dependence, right? So your cost, whatever metric you have based on your uncertainty on this last edge is still dependent on how you got there, but it is monotonic, meaning that if you got there with less uncertainty, your cost from there will also be less. So that means that you can always take the path up to there with, the l with arriving there with the smallest uh, eigenvalue, whatever your cost is based on that uncertainty. O of course, assuming that that is also uh, a monotonic function in the sense that if your uncertainty is higher, your cost will somehow, somehow be, uh, be higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you think that the cost is strictly dependent, but the expected cost is not one dimension of the belief. Uh, yes, 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 also, right? Because if you, once you have the belief here, then, of course, the future is, but you don't know what, the, what belief you will arrive here. Because you were talking about a roadmap in state space. So you can arrive at that same node with different uncertainties. And how you're, what uncertainty you arrive at this node will, be, will, be, will inform what your cost is going out from that node. Yeah, but a priori, if you're talking about the expected belief, you can get uh, one dimension for each node. If I, if I was doing multiple times, right? Uh, well, let's talk offline. I don't, I don't think I... I'm, I'm, I missed a little bit your point, but yeah, maybe. Um, but yeah, in this case, we certainly can relax and in a Dijkstra-like fashion. So we can just use Dijkstra's, with, and then we also have the added advantage of a lower dimensionality of our belief. Is it satisfying? I don't know. It's just, it's just I just wanted to talk to you about it. I'd love to hear your comments. Uh, uh, representation may not be rich enough. That might be, right, because you only have one number for your uncertainty. May, you may not see the nice behavior you saw in the light dark domain case that you want to get out of these uh, of these kind of algorithms. But I don't know, just a suggestion here, but I think this is an interesting challenge in, um, in belief space planning. So there's a couple of other challenges I want to mention. Some of you may be particularly interested in this. So we always make, or always, but oftentimes we make the maximum likelihood observation assumption. That means that we have deterministic belief dynamics, I'm not going into the details, and that is used often seems to work just fine. You get the same nice behaviors. Um, but yeah, there has never really been any analysis, as far as I know, um, whether this assumption, how reasonable it actually is. is there, can you actually just give me any example where this is a bad idea? I have never seen it, where it really causes a noti noticeably suboptimal result, or where there the difference between not taking the assumption and making the assumption will give you s completely different solutions. I've never seen it or be able to intuitively construct one. So I think that's an in interesting challenge to, to analyze that assumption a little bit more. Uh, and other challenges, that I find interesting is this truncated Gaussians that, that people use to actually also do with uh, uh, truncating them to compute the probability of collision along a path. Um, that is not invariant to the time step. If you make the time step smaller, you get different results and different optim optimal paths. And that, that is very unsatisfying because that means that there's something wrong uh, or something not principled in applying this Gaussian truncation to do this uh, obstacle uh, uh, avoidance. 
Anyway, these are a couple things, but the main point of my talk was, of course, the optimal structure, substructure problem. It's always an issue in roadmap-based motion planning under uncertainty. Um, and I think that papers that, that deal with, that, do, that use these kind of approaches should really talk about this issue and not just sweep it under the rug. Uh, because, yeah, you're kind of doing, there might be good reasons to just do Dijkstra, but say that, that you're aware of the, the fact that it's not really any optimal thing. And, and I mentioned some other challenges as well uh, about the assumption. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are you assuming that your uncertainty will never decrease? Like, are we no longer in the light dark problem where you can keep even being more uncertain? No, 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 you can also decrease your uncertainty. Then, yeah. uh, in your, in your brief, you said that if the circle is smaller at one step, then we know we can take that path. Yeah. Uh, but then, if, for example, if, you're, if you had a purely x ellipse from one path and a purely y ellipse from the other path, yeah. and if that step reduced the y uncertainty, your y ellipse could have been greater. Yeah. No, no, no. That the is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's totally fine. But okay. th 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 basically, by reducing this richness, as I said, you have a smaller circle, and your belief dynamics for this this representation doesn't know whether you have an x or y, okay. and it will just give you a, a less tight upper bound. Uh, so, but the upper bound will be bigger in in the case, even though the underlying real uncertainty would be smaller in the other path. But given your representation, you would be doing the right thing. <laughs>